The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own, and The Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. Of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. We love it. Yeah, good day, Tokers and Tokettes, and welcome to the show. It is Tuesday, February 5th, 2013, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. So glad you could make it here. Got all sorts of great stuff to bring you today. We were, uh, if you were here just an hour ago, there was a live press teleconference from Washington, D.C., sponsored by Marijuana Policy Project that featured Representative Jared Polis from Colorado and Representative Earl Blumenauer, my representative from right here in the state of Oregon. They've introduced a couple of federal bills. We'll tell you about that in our 420 radio news we've also got some audio clips from them in our behind the headlines segment and it's always so exciting when we can get our federal representatives saying truthful and supportive things about marijuana legalization so we'll get right to that uh, after our first couple of breaks here also on today's show at half past we're going to go all the way across the pond with normal uk's greg dehote we're going to talk to him right out of of england he's in uh, sussex england he's going to tell us the latest with what's happening in marijuana legalization in England and on the continent. Also, I'm going to ask him about that recent Irish case that we talked about on the news yesterday, about the man suing in the European court uh, to overturn the Irish ruling against his use of Rick Simpson oil. So that'll be an interesting talk with Greg coming up at half past. Also on today's show, we'll have time for a radical rant. When we get to the end of the show, I'm going to compare and contrast Colorado 2013 to California 1997. There's a story up on Huffington Post that's really got me worried about how our opponents could seize upon our momentum and swing that pendulum back the other way and affect us in a negative way as we push for marijuana legalization in other states. So make sure you stay tuned and check that out. Also on today's show, Daily Toker Tunes. It's Electric Tuesday. We're going to bring you a song from Symbionic and it's called Censorship. So we'll listen to that for our 20 after break. We hope you have a good one with us. Also, we want to remind you, got all sorts of great shows coming up later, and we want to welcome back to the 420 Radio Org Network, Cannabis Cuts from San Francisco, California, back on the network. Their first broadcast, or replay, I should say, will be on Friday at noon Pacific. So check them out. Check out our calendar at 420radio.org slash schedule to get all the latest replay information. We're back with the 420 Radio News right after these messages. Stick around. You're listening to The Russ Belville Show. Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. 
California is the center of marijuana consciousness. That's why High Times Magazine is returning to the Golden State for our second High Times Medical Cannabis Cup in Los Angeles. That's right. Come to L.A. Center Studios on February 16th and 17th for this high-flying event. Meet the medical cannabis industry, visit our extra special medicating area, and sample the best cannabis products of Southern California. There will be cultivation seminars and presentations about getting pot legalized, not just in California, but everywhere. Be there on Saturday evening when we host a Rock'em Sock'em concert with surprise musical guests. And don't forget Sunday night and the High Times Medical Cannabis Cup Awards when we honor the best sativa, best indica, best hybrid, best concentrate, and best edibles of the L.A. medical cannabis scene. Plus, we present the High Times Lifetime Achievement Award to marijuana superstar Tommy Chong. Come to the City of the Angels on February 16th and 17th for a High Times Cannabis Celebration. Go to MedCanCup.com for details. Live the high life. Be proud of who you are. Be part of the growing cannabis community. Now it's time for your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, February 5th, 2013. I'm Russ Belleville. Federal marijuana bills introduced, this from the Marijuana Policy Project. Members of Congress introduced bills Tuesday to end marijuana prohibition and start regulating and taxing marijuana like alcohol at the federal level. Representative Jared Polis, Democrat of Colorado, introduced the Ending Federal Marijuana Prohibition Act of 2013, which would remove marijuana from Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substances Act and establish a system in which marijuana is regulated similarly to alcohol at the federal level. It would also remove marijuana from the jurisdiction of the Drug Enforcement Administration and place it in the jurisdiction of a renamed Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Marijuana, Firearms, and Explosives. Representative Earl Blumenauer, Democrat of Oregon, introduced the Marijuana Tax Equity Act, which would create a federal excise tax on the sale of marijuana similar to that imposed on the sale of alcohol. It would also require occupational taxes for those engaged in the industry. A record high 58% of Americans think marijuana should be made legal, according to a survey conducted by public policy polling from November 30th to December 2nd of last year. A USA Today Gallup poll released in December found that 63% of Americans believe the federal government should not interfere in the implementation of state marijuana laws, such as those approved in Washington and Colorado. Some state justices signal support for marijuana dispensary bans from the Los Angeles Times. Several members of the California Supreme Court appeared inclined Tuesday to uphold mar medical marijuana bans by cities and counties. Justice Ming W. Chin said during oral arguments Tuesday, quote, The legislature knows how to say, thou shalt not ban dispensaries. They didn't say that, end quote. The state high court is considering whether a Riverside City ban on dispensaries is barred by state laws that authorize cannabis for medical purposes. About 200 cities and counties have such bans, and more are expected if the court rules for the local governments. Rhode Island marijuana bill introduced tomorrow. Uh, state Representative Edith Ayeo, Democrat of Providence, chair of the Rhode Island House Committee on the Judiciary, will introduce a bill Wednesday, February 6th, to make possession of limited amounts of marijuana legal for adults 21 and older, and establish a system in which marijuana is regulated and taxed similarly to alcohol. State Senator Donna Nesselbush, Democrat of Pawtucket, will sponsor the bill in the Senate. The representative and senator will discuss details of the Marijuana Regulation, Control, and Taxation Act at a news conference hosted by the Coalition for Marijuana Regulation tomorrow at 3 o'clock Eastern Time in the House Judiciary Room, State House Room 205. The introduction of the bill will come just one day after members of Congress introduce historic bills to regulate and tax marijuana like alcohol at the federal level. <laughs> marijuana decriminalization bills introduced in Vermont from the Marijuana Policy Project. A tripartisan group of 39 co-sponsors, led by Representative Christopher Pearson, progressive of Burlington, has introduced a bill to remove criminal penalties for possession of small amounts of marijuana and replace them with a civil infraction and fine, similar to a parking ticket. Governor Pete Shumlin has expressed support for decriminalization and is expected to sign one of these bills into law if approved by the legislature. If passed, H-200 would make possession of up to two ounces of marijuana, two mature plants, and seven immature plants 
punishable by a citation and a fine of up to $100 without jail time. Under current law, possession of up to two ounces of marijuana is a misdemeanor, punishable by up to six months in jail for a first offense and up to two years in jail for a subsequent offense. <laughs> South Dakota panel kills medical defense in marijuana cases. This from the San Francisco Gate. A proposal to let people charged with possessing small amounts of marijuana argue in court that they need it for medical reasons was narrowly rejected Tuesday by a South Dakota House committee torn between compassion for chronically ill people in pain and fear that it could lead to increased drug use. The Health and Human Services Committee voted 7-6 to six to kill the bill, which was sponsored by two lawmakers with roots in law enforcement. Representative Melissa Magstat, Republican of Watertown, a nurse, said the South Dakota Medical Association and Nurses Association opposed the measure, which would allow an unregulated and untested drug to be used for medical purposes. Marijuana often leads people to use other drugs, she said. Quote, if you talk to drug users, nine times out of ten, they started with marijuana first. End quote, Representative Magstat said. That's your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, February 5th, 2013. I'm Russ Belville. When we come back, we go behind the headlines with clips from Representative Blumenauer and Representative Polis from today's teleconference and more discussion of the federal bills to end marijuana prohibition. You're listening to the Russ Belville Show on 420radio.org. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. I'm Sub Cool from Team Green Avenger. At TGAgenetics.com, we are working on the leading edge of medical strains. Our strains are rigorously tested for THC, CBD, THCV, and other critical cannabinoids. Know your grow. Check out our genetic diversity at TGAgenetics.com. The home of Jelly Bean, Jack the Ripper, Vortex, and other award-winning cannabis strains. Welcome back, everyone. 13 after the hour. Time for us to go behind the headlines. And again, earlier this morning, uh, this afternoon, I should say, earlier this afternoon, unless you were in Hawaii, uh, there was a, <laughs> a press conference in Washington, D.C., from the Marijuana Policy Project featuring Representative Jared Polis, a Democrat from Colorado, and Representative Earl Blumenauer, the Democrat from Oregon, speaking with respect to the bills they have introduced in the federal Congress. Jared Polis introduced the Ending Federal Marijuana Prohibition Act of 2013. And what's notable about this bill is it's not a rescheduling to a different Schedule 2 or Schedule 3. This removes marijuana from the drug scheduling entirely at the federal level. There would be no marijuana at the federal level uh, as far as drug scheduling. This would not invalidate the drug scheduling of the respective states, like Oregon, which is scheduled at Schedule 2, and say... Oklahoma could keep it Schedule 1, right? So this would not uh, preclude the states from continuing their bans on marijuana. It would just end the ban at the federal level. Also, it uh, puts it in the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Marijuana, Firearms, or and Explosives, uh, or as Hunter S. Thompson used to call it, the start of a good weekend. Uh, so that'll be interesting to see that uh, happen if this bill can get passed. I didn't get a chance to get my question uh, answered, which was, you know, given that the Republicans are in control of the House of Representatives right now, and they're going to be uh, putting, uh, you know, have Republicans in char charge of all the committees, 
uh, which committee are they aiming for and do they think they're going to get a hearing? I don't have much hope, folks. I'm afraid that uh, with the politics the way they are now, it does not look good for getting a hearing on our bills. But it is good news to hear our federal representatives finally speaking up for marijuana legalization, ending federal marijuana prohibition. This is Representative Jared Polis from earlier describing why he felt emboldened uh, to move forward with this bill at this time. Uh, there has been an enormous evolution on American opinion uh, on the issue of the uh, the prohibition of marijuana. Uh, Americans have increasingly come to the conclusion that the drug war is a failed policy. Uh, that while substance abuse is a real problem we need to address, we need to look at indre- addressing it increasingly as a public health issue more than a criminal issue. Representative Polis also cited the enormous costs involved with continuing to futilely try to stop adults from using marijuana. Uh, Americans are uh, sick and tired of the, the cost of the war on drugs. And whether we're talking about the financial costs in a time of deficits or whether we're talking about the human costs and the lives that are lost uh, uh, through the gangs and the criminal activity uh, because of the illicit marijuana trade, uh, Americans, um, as indicated in the votes in Colorado and Washington, as indicated uh, by public opinion of polls, are simply saying enough is enough. Let's try a new way. Let's try a new policy. Representative Earl Blumenauer also spoke on the need to pass his bill, which is a federal excise tax, the Marijuana Tax Equity Act, which would tax marijuana similarly to how alcohol is taxed at the federal level. Uh, Representative Blumenauer has been a longtime supporter of marijuana law reforms, and he made his bona fides known uh, in his introductory statements. As a freshman member of the Oregon legislature, I was able to vote as my state was the first to decriminalize uh, small amounts of marijuana and made it the uh, equivalent of a violation, a traffic ticket. Uh, Since that time, 14 states have joined Oregon in decriminalization. And after California, 1996, authorized medical marijuana, we've ha- we now have 19 jurisdictions that authorize it. And as Jared pointed out, we had the, f- the first two states, and there will be more, that have uh, uh, legalized uh, marijuana for recreational use. While these are the first two bills to be introduced in this Congress for marijuana law reform, Representative Blumenauer did state that there could be another eight to ten bills to be introduced uh, for various subjects, such as industrial hemp farming or allowing states to set medical marijuana policy. We were unable to get a question in to ask him details on some of those proposals, but we look forward to speaking to the congressman in the future and getting more information for our listeners. Congressman Blumenauer also pointed out the enormous amount of money that could be made through passing his federal excise tax bill. Absolutely. There's an opportunity for us to make, at a minimum, a $100 billion difference over the next 10 years as we shift from enforcement. We arrested two-thirds of a million people in 2011 for use of a substance that half Americans think should be legal and more than two-thirds say the states should be free to regulate. We are really in a, a different world now where we've got these representatives openly calling for ends to marijuana prohibition, to taxing marijuana like alcohol, and we have people like Representative Mitch McConnell, or Senator, excuse me, Senator Mitch McConnell, uh, calling for industrial hemp farming, the highest-ranking Republican in the Senate, joining Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky in calling for the renewal of America's hemp heritage. Also, uh, a sign of the times is from the Marijuana Policy Project, Project, uh, which states, in light of the growing momentum behind efforts to regulate marijuana like alcohol at the state and federal levels, the nation's largest marijuana policy reform organization, the Marijuana Policy Project, has changed the name of its Federal Political Action Committee from the MPP Medical Marijuana Pack to the Marijuana Policy Project Pack. 
This is significant, folks. Now it seems as if reform, even at the federal level, does not have to couch itself in terms of compassion and medical use only. The country indeed is ready for the discussion of full legalization, treating it like alcohol for all adults 21 and over. Uh, in future episodes, I'll have more highlights from this press conference, including one reporter who had asked about DUI marijuana and what we might do uh, as the feds move forward and as the states move forward in marijuana policy reform, what we might do about the case of people driving under the influence of marijuana. It's a strange question to those of us in reform because it makes us wonder what you think nobody's driving now and how are we catching them now? It's not as if uh, marijuana being illegal gives pe marijuana being legal gives people a free driving high card. Too many buttons. Too much to do. <laughs> hey, we're going to take a break. And uh, when we come back, we will have Daily Token Tune for you for Electric Tuesday. Stick around. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you talk it to that reefer man. Marijuana is harmless. That's what everybody says these days. It's fun. It's recreational. Some even call it medicine. But every year, millions of young people find out that marijuana is extremely dangerous. Every year they find out that it's deadly. Marijuana smoke is lethal and toxic. Don't believe anything you've ever heard positive about smoking marijuana. It will kill you. Really? It's really gonna kill you. It's don't 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 smoke it. It will really, really kill you. Seriously. It's gonna kill you. Paid for by the we're not even trying anymore. We made it all up anti drug whatever thing of America. <laughs> Oh, that's right. Yeah. It's just like that, baby. Don't stop. Mmm. I like it. You like it, baby? Yeah. Feels good, right? Big Daddy Things. Boogie, rollery, rollery, rollery. Don't Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Electric Tuesday, featuring the latest in electronic dance music and other cutting edge genres. You can get downloads and more information about all our Daily Toker Tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your Daily Toker Tunes. For today, we get a little bit of a tune here from Symbionic, and that's spelled P-S-Y-M-B-I-O-N-I-C, Symbionic. And the description here says it provides us with a party-centric EP of dubstep and drumstep. Now, I, I, I've heard dubstep. I don't know what drumstep is. Dubstep with drums, I guess. Uh, that have a future bass and funk influences that are evident throughout. Also features some collaborations with Pharaoh and Great Scott. This is part of uh, electronic music producer Symbionic's oral experiences with multi-tempo bass music. 
and uh, many cultural influences. Symbionic demonstrates heavy involvement both on the stage and behind the scenes at electronic showcases such as his local South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. So turn it over to uh, Austin, Texas' own Symbionic. This is Censorship. This is Dan Michaels. If you're looking for professional voice talent for your commercial or podcast, I'm your man. 
Visit danmichaelsaudio.com for more information. There is a peaceful solution called a peace revolution. And now let's take back America. Hi, this is Willie Nelson. Like millions of freedom-loving Americans, I'm a marijuana smoker, and I don't think that that should be any of the government's business. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the responsible use of marijuana. The next time you light up, take the time to let your elected officials know how you feel. It's time we legalize marijuana and stop treating marijuana smokers like criminals. For more information on how you can help legalize marijuana, please contact Normal at NORML.org. You want answers? I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! And you have offended a Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth! Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Radical Rant. All right, we're calling an audible. We're moving the Radical Rant up. I'm having difficulties getting in touch with Greg DeHoe out in the UK, where it's currently 11.30 p.m., so maybe he's napping. So we'll move on to the Radical Rant and see what we can do in the meantime to get him online. And today's rant, it, it's got me thinking in a very cynical way, uh, as I often do, about the possibility of the pendulum swinging back on us. You know, maybe it's too many talks that I had, late night talks with uh, white wine and, and ro- hand-rolled doobies with Keith Strop, where we talked about his experience in the 70s where all the public opinion polls were shooting up as far as uh, support for marijuana legalization from 12% in the, in 1969 to 30% by the time they hit 78 and how 11 states you know felt, you know one year after another were decriminalizing marijuana and they felt the wind was at our backs and then we had Reagan in the 80s and just say no and parents groups coming out with gas mask bongs and scaring the hell out of the parents that this is what your kids are using. And, and it, of course, it was tied to cocaine at the time, too, and it, and it frightened the hell out of people. Well, I can't help but worry when I hear people in the federal uh, Congress and, and some of our reformers now saying the wind is at our backs for me to want to have to turn around and to see when that pendulum is going to swing back. And I can feel some undercurrents of the pendulum swinging back. Uh, One of them is the Project Sam effort to try to paint a a new, kinder, gentler drug war. Uh, And another is when I see the inevitable, um, how shall we put it, the inevitable taking advantage of the structure of the new laws, the new freedoms that we've gotten. And I don't say this or I don't bring this up to cast blame or aspersions. Um, be like blaming a dog for licking its nuts. That, that's what dogs do, right? You just, you accept that a dog will lick himself. And similarly, we have to accept that stoners, tokers, us, we are a very creative people and, uh, we are, we love our herb and we love to smoke it. And some of us love to sell it. And so that leads me to the, to the point of this rant. And that is. When California passed Prop 215 in 1996, it contained within it a very wide loophole, the clause that says that a a doctor can recommend cannabis for any other illness, for any other condition for which he he or she feels it will provide relief. And of course, that became the medical marijuana that we have today in California, where pretty much anybody can spend 35, 40 bucks at a dock in the wall and, uh, you know, complain of anxiety or a headache and get a medical marijuana recommendation. And again, not casting aspersions. Good job, Dennis Perone. Good job, Bill Panzer, getting that kind of stuff in there and creating almost a de facto legalization in a lot of, in a lot of California. You know, there's nothing wrong with that, but the natural inclination to take advantage of that loophole and, which has led to, you know, the Venice beach, you know, sign twirlers and has led to, you know, cannabis cups and and rap concerts with doctors and tents and these kind of things. This was naturally going to happen as people who've been repressed for so long, you know, reach out for that newfound freedom and stretch the limits of the law in every way they can. But the fallout from that, the pendulum swinging back on that came in 1998 when Oregon and Washington and Alaska had to come come up with some very strict condition lists in order to get their laws passed. They had to soothe all the legislators. No, 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 no. This isn't like California. 
this isn't where we're just going to legalize it for almost anything. We got a real strict list. And as medical marijuana has evolved, it's evolved in a stricter and stricter and stricter fashion. It's evolved to give us, you know, more strict condition lists, smaller amounts of medicine that patients are allowed to have, lesser uh, ability to grow plants, or in some states not even be able to grow them at all, have to rely on dispensaries. And a lot of it, a lot of it is reaction to what is perceived to be taking advantage of the California law. So I want to compare and com contrast that California around 1997 to Colorado and what I see happening now in 2013. This is a, a, a report that comes off of Huffington Post, and the title of it was Free Marijuana, Craigslist Ads Offer Free Weed with a Twist to Comply with Colorado Pot Laws. Let me just read a little from this. Under Amendment 20, Colorado's medical marijuana law, Coloradans cannot legally sell marijuana unless they are a licensed medical marijuana dispensary. And residents cannot legally buy from a dispensary unless they are a reg registered medical marijuana patient. Under Amendment 64, the regulations for the sale of recreational marijuana have not been established yet, so no buying that way either. But... Under Amendment 64, an adult 21 and over can gift up to an ounce of pot to another adult legally. So some Coloradoans are getting creative with the loopholes that currently exist in state law and are offering free marijuana on Craigslist with the purchase of another product or a small donation. No medical marijuana card required. Over the weekend, CBS4 was the first to report on these Craigslist ads that offer free pot and found an offer for free marijuana with the sponsorship of some worms at a worm farm. Sponsor 100 worms with a certain amount of money and get a free one-eighth ounce of pot. Another ad boasts Amendment 64 and 20 compliant and offers fresh and cured hash and honey oil for free, but for a $60 or $40 donation. None of these items are for sale. I ask donations for my time, energy, the ability to grow the plant and then make oils, the cost of butane and ice for hash. Thank you very much. It's free, except for the money that you give me for it. Another donation-based ad asks for a $30 donation for a free eighth ounce or a $60 donation for a free quarter an ounce of pot. All donations proceeds go to supporting marijuana law reform. Several ads were posted from Denver's Four Strains Pipe and Tobacco advertising two grams of free marijuana with the $30 purchase of smoking accessories or tobacco at the shop. Westward uh, spoke with Mike Polk and Felicia L., two caregivers who run Four Strains, who say that the promotions have been a success. Felicia stressed to Westward that the caregivers are really not making any money from the free two-gram giveaway. What we're selling is smoking accessories. And, right, you're making money on smoking accessories, which people are buying so they can get the free weed with it. See, all these little games, these little wink, wink, nudge, nudge games, you know, oh, it's not, a, I'm not selling anything. I'm merely giving it to you freely. And you, in a completely unrelated transaction, are freely giving me $60. But they have nothing to do with each other. Oh, no, no, you're not buying marijuana. You're sponsoring some worms. And thanks to sponsoring those worms, I'll give you an eighth. Come on now. Every time we do something like this, every single one of these headlines that gets out there gives more and more ammunition to the people who hate what we're doing and want to use it to frighten and scare the public into more and more restrictive marijuana laws. Don't think the Kevin Sabets of the world don't see this stuff going on and use it in every talk they give. Now, again, what do we do about it? Because, again dog licking its nuts. What, what what do you expect people to do? People that have marijuana are going to try to find a way to make money off of that marijuana. So what do we do? And what's going to happen as more and more states look at marijuana legalization and it's being discussed in committee whether or not they should have a clause that allows people to gift an ounce to one another. And then they look over at Colorado and go, oh no, we don't want to have that. And they'll all be on Craigslist giving away worm sponsorships. Or they'll craft the language to be much stricter, that no other items can be given. A lot. And it just becomes more and more ludicrous. It's almost like a, 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 a 
growing pain we have to go through in this movement, I guess. Uh, a state where things are going to have to get even more illogical and ridiculous than they already are before they, uh, marijuana can finally just get to the point where it is a commodity, is an agricultural commodity like any other, and can be used for whatever purpose people want it to be used for. But I do worry. I do worry that these excesses, that these people playing wink-wink, nudge-nudge games are going to make it harder for the next few states to try to legalize. And it's another concern of mine when people are discussing whether or not to move forward with 2014 or 2016 is that these kind of shenanigans aren't going to get any better after 2014. If Colorado's allowed to go for the next four years with these kind of headlines, these kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge games, then how much harder will it be in 2016 to try to get something passed? Perhaps moving for 2014 is the right course of action so that there can be more examples for the country to look at, not just Colorado, not just focus on how Colorado or Washington might be doing things. Because if those are the two examples, when we move forward for 2016, they may take the worst of what happens in Colorado to restrict us and take the worst of what's already restricting in Washington with the DUID and combine all that together and no home grow and combine all that together. So it's imperative upon us to continue to set a good example. I, you know, what, what can we do? We can't force people not to put these ads on Craigslist, I suppose. I guess we could choose not to buy from these people. Oh, I'm sorry, not to sponsor the worms at their worm farm or give them free donations freely with no consideration for that money, that, that weed that we're getting back. But, you know, it's, uh, it's ridiculous to even try to stop it. There's no way that we can. So as we move forward, we need to make some pretty uh, tough decisions about moving forward in 2014 to try to circumvent some of these problems doing something within our community to try to address these problems, make sure that they don't happen, continuing to keep the pressure on our state lawmakers, our local officials, to understand that those kind of situations are reflective of prohibition. The only reason people are selling worm sponsorships on Craigslist is because right now they can't open a shop. The regulations aren't there yet for people to actually sell this. And the law of supply and demand is is going to continue to force the hand of many, many people. The law of supply and demand is going to continue to generate this market. And it's going to keep, and, and now that it's legal for people to possess marijuana, the providers of marijuana are more emboldened to, to want to supply that market. So we can't take too long when it comes to putting together these regulations. Let's make sure that we uh, you know, put our best foot forward here and try as much as we can not to abuse the newfound freedoms that we've recognized. All right, folks, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, I don't think we will have Greg from the UK. I don't see him online. So we will figure out something for this last segment. Stick around. Russ Belleville Show reminds you to never smoke and drive in Terry. Hang out for a while and share. He's a 
day was hard and your work was long and you need a break from all that's wrong. You better look at the clock cause it's 419. Time to reach in that pocket for your bag of green and smoke that weed. You're tuned smoke into the Rush Belleville Show. Activism begins with ACT. The Rush Belleville Show features the stories of hardworking grassroots activists working for an end to prohibition in today's activist agenda. Well, I apologize. We're unable to get uh, Greg DeHote on today for our Across the Pond segment, but we will move him for another segment later on in the week once we get in touch with him. In the meantime, I'd like to go over some of the news stories that we've been covering and offer a couple more uh, uh, views of these stories. There's a, there's, the South Dakota story has really affected me here. Uh, if you don't know, South Dakota has tried in 2006 and in 2010 to pass a medical marijuana bill. Uh, initiative, I should say, Ma- medical marijuana initiative. And it's gotten worse over time. In 2006, when they failed at it, it was 48% is what it failed with at the at the ballot box. In this last election, when they tried, in 2010, it failed with 36%. It went from 48 to 36. Now, part of that could owe to, as you know, many reformers talk about, the off-year elections. 2006 and, 2000, and 2010 are not presidential election years, and that makes it more difficult for us to pass our bills as our demographic turns out more for the presidential election years. But to see a 12-point decline over just a four-year period is pretty startling. And again, I think a lot of this owes to the perception of medical marijuana as it is in the West Coast. You look at 2006, 2007 as being uh, around the time when Harborside starts up, around the time we get the big dispensaries starting up. And of course, after uh, after Obama's election in, in, in 2008, promising not to go after dispensaries, and then the Ogden memo in 2009, we saw a proliferation of dispensaries. And thus we see in that f- intervening four-year span, 12% lower support from the people of South Dakota, fearing being, I don't know what they fear, overrun by pot shops, uh, gateway to legalization, whatever they might fear. So this most recent bill in the Health and Human Services Committee was two lawmakers trying to put together just a medical necessity defense. Now, the guys who put this bill out, it was a Republican named Dan Kaiser and a Republican named Craig Thiessen. Kaiser is a police officer, currently. Teason is a retired police chief. So, you know, usually in these situations when a medical bill's going up or any sort of marijuana bill's going up, it's law enforcement that's showing up to testify against it. These two guys are from law enforcement, and they sponsored this bill. Now, for those of you who don't know what a medical necessity defense is, this is literally the least you can do for a patient. It's the least you can do. How it works is, if you're a patient, let's say you got, I don't know, multiple sclerosis, and they catch you growing a plant, got got a bunch of marijuana on you, they will arrest you, they will charge you with a felony, they will keep you locked up until you can bail out, and if you can't bail out, they keep you locked up, and of course, while you're locked up, you can't use any of your uh, medical marijuana for your, your condition. And then you'll go to trial for your felony. Of course, you'll have to get yourself a public uh, pretender or you'll have to get an attorney of your own. And after all that, when you go to court, what the medical necessity defense is, yes, your honor, I'm a criminal. I'm a terrible, terrible criminal. I had marijuana plants and I had marijuana. I broke the law, but, but I had to. I had to break the law or I'd die. That's what a medical necessity defense is. It's basically... Yes, it's admitting to, I'm a guilty criminal, I broke the laws. However, I had no choice but to break the laws because of the imminent danger to my health. Medical necessity is how Robert Randall got medical marijuana in the first place back in 1978. It was for his glaucoma. He sued the federal government, said, you know, without marijuana, I'm going to go blind. And that, you know, going blind outweighed going to jail for me. So this was the least they could do. These these two Republican law enforcement background guys in South Dakota, these two representatives in South Dakota, or I'm sorry, one's a representative, one's a senator, introduced this bill 
to give patients at least the chance to say to a judge and a jury, look, I'm really, really sick. Please don't put me in prison. Please. The very least, right? Failed in a seven to six vote today. Failed seven to six. Now, how it failed included the vote of this representative, Melissa Magstat, this nurse, a nurse, people, who said the South Dakota Medical Association and Nurses Association opposed the measure because if you talk to drug users, nine times out of ten, they started with marijuana first. Yes, she actually says marijuana often leads people to use other drugs. She actually brings out the gateway theory. Uh, the only thing I would say is that you talk to parents who have lost their children to drugs. Right. And they will inevitably say that they started off with marijuana. They probably started off with milk and then went to beer. And then they went to bourbon and then they might have gone to marijuana. The gateway theory doesn't work. Maybe. It's a reality. Here's another South Dakota uh, representative, a uh, Republican from Sioux Falls named Steve Hickey, who said that this bill to allow really sick, really, really sick people already charged with felonies for marijuana to argue in court that they're really, really sick, you know, and to have medical experts come and testify that they're really, really sick. This Republican representative, Steve Hickey, said that the bill would send a mixed message on the legislature's view on marijuana. It'd send a mixed message. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, terrible, per terrible, terrible pot user who has cancer, who's trying to argue to a judge that he shouldn't be thrown in prison for it. We wouldn't want to send you a mixed message. We think marijuana is really bad. Even for you, it's really bad. We want to be consistent about that. Make sure you know that marijuana is really, really bad. Even if you got cancer, even if you want to argue to a judge that, you know, you'd rather not die in prison. Sorry, we got to be consistent about our messages, right, Representative Hickey? He actually, this is his quote. Check this quote from Hickey here. If we say yes, we're talking out of both sides of our mouth. We don't want it to be legal, but we want it to be legal for this. <sighs> Representative, a medical necessity defense does not make it legal. It would still be illegal. That cancer patient could argue to the judge that he has a medical necessity, had to use marijuana, the judge could acquit him on the medical necessity defense, and if the cops caught him the next day with pot, they could bust him again and send him through the whole process again because pot would still be illegal, even with that medical necessity defense. It's amazing the short-sightedness and cruelty of these people. And you don't wish for anyone to get cancer or to go through something serious like that. I would never wish for Representative Steve Hickey's wife, for example, to have breast cancer and have to go through chemo and be puking her guts out and, and need some medical cannabis and perhaps get busted and thrown in prison for doing so. I would never wish that on someone. That would be awful. It would be awful to think that's what it would take for someone like Representative Steve Hickey to see the light, for someone he loves to need this medicine. That would be an awful thing to think, wouldn't it? It's just amazing to me. There was also um, there was there was one uh, Republican, uh, Representative Jacqueline Sly of Rapid City, said she would be tempted to seek marijuana if a family member was dying of cancer and needed it to manage pain. The bill would have merely given such people a defense in court, she said. Some committee members asked whether people arrested for marijuana possession can already argue in court that they need it for medical purposes. This is another thing that's frustrating when you start following politics like this. And, and again, you know, for these legislators, a lot of them, they have a lot of issues to cover and they can't be experts on all of them, certainly. But that kind of a question tells me you didn't do any due diligence in studying up, you know, what issue it was that was coming before you that day. You just showed up to work and expected a bunch of people to yammer and you already knew what you were going to vote. Because Emmett Reistroffer, uh, who helped organize one of the medical marijuana ballot measures, said the South Dakota Supreme Court in 2003 rejected a medical necessity defense by a, paral a paralyzed man who argued he needed to smoke marijuana to ease chronic muscle spasms. So you got people on this committee, this 13-member committee, asking whether or not, well, is it, uh, 
Isn't there already a medical necessity offense? Isn't there? When a decade ago, that was settled by their Supreme Court. It's just another frustration. And again, so sorry for the people in South Dakota here who can't even get medical necessity defense. That even a person dying of HIV AIDS, emaciated to the bone, could sit in front of a judge and would not be allowed to argue the medical use at all. There's no, there's no mitigating circumstance when it comes to these trials when you don't have a medical necessity defense. There's a law that says having pot puts you in prison. You have pot, so you go to prison. And, and this is just, it, 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 this can't be the way that we deal with sickness and, and, and disability in this country. It, it's, it's amazing sometimes, and, and, and sometimes being on this show and, and getting to talk to you guys out there in these states, in South Dakota, in Iowa, in Tennessee, in Florida, all over the country, all over the world, is sometimes the only thing that gives me hope in the concept of America as a people, as a, as, as a country, as a nation. Because when I see polls coming out of regions of the country where, you know, entire swaths of the country where people can't even see the basic human dignity in not putting a cancer patient in prison for smoking a flower. And I think, how can I be countrymen with people that are that way? How can they and I be both Americans. How can that be what America stands for? It's frustrating. But then, then I see you guys in the chat room and I see people, you know, you think I'm pulling my hair out here in Oregon. You guys are living in it in Texas, in, in Kentucky, in Michigan and all these other states, you know, but through this, through our community, through 420 radio, we can at least feel like we are a movement. We are a nation. We are a people that are continuing to fight for what, what I believe America is really all about, right? You know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Well, cannabis saves lives. And currently we don't have any liberty for using it. And pursuit of happiness, well, that's pretty much part of the definition of smoking weed, isn't it? Pursuing happiness. And, and, for, and for a country that is struggling with health care costs, that is struggling to you know, provide any sort of public health care for people to deny this medicine, to deny cannabis, to deny people the ability to use it, to, to even go so far in South Dakota as to put people in cages over their medical use of it, where they have no choice but to use it or suffer. And these, these lawmakers in South Dakota, one of the, one of the other quotes was, well, there's all sorts of other medicines they can take. Well, yeah, there are. Some of them work kind of a little, and then they cause other side effects that you got to take another medicine for that kind of fixes those side effects. But why should someone have to take a substandard level of living? Why should someone have to live a life with all these side effects and all of these pills with plastic tins of pills with plastic tins, that doesn't make sense, plastic bins of pills, you know, to just to keep track of what pill you're supposed to take at what time. And we think of that as normal. We think of that, you know, a, a panoply of these pharmaceutical prescriptions that our seniors are taking, you know, dozens and dozens of pills a day. And that's just status quo. That's just everyday life. But the idea that someone would go grab that stinky flower and dry it up and smoke it, to, to, to help themselves or vaporize it or bake it into some cookies or something. That's radical. That's unconventional. That's so controversial. I mean, if you want to know part of the reason why I go by the name radical Russ with the quotation marks is because I don't really think I'm that radical. I don't think what I think is that crazy. I think, you know, if I'm a radical, then, you know, I guess the founding fathers were radicals. I guess, you know, your average hippies were radicals. I guess people that, you know, believe in a different paradigm for medical treatment are radicals. I don't know what you think about these uh, these concepts. I'm going to take it into hour two, Toker Talk Radio.
For Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. And until next time, take care of each other, Tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it.